again. This is Musical Talk. Musical Talk. The UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Musical Musical Talk. Talk. The UK independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, my name is Johnny Partridge and I'm playing Zach in a chorus line at the London Palladium and we are here in my dressing room which is the Judy Garland Suite. You get the crop of a lot here, don't you? (laughs) I guess you do. I guess that's one way to phrase it. So uh, we haven't got long, so let's quickly talk about uh, chorus line. Tell us, you know, your involvement with the piece. Well, obviously I play Zach in a chorus line. That is groundbreaking because you are on stage for how long of the show? I'm on stage for an hour on stage. I'm off stage for an hour. Uh, I think I'm on stage more than any other Zach previously. uh, And I'm dancing more than any other Zach previously. Okay, so that's interesting because the the course uh, course line was at the Drury Lane Theatre, you know, after after it had a big success on on Broadway and it came to London. And... Because I was under the impression that not many changes have been made from that production to this one, but you probably know more. So tell us what changes have been. I think there have been quite a few changes in the sense that there have been some costume changes, some design changes in that way. Um, I don't get to wear that lovely brown jumper, <laughs> which I'm really relieved about. Who wants to wear brown? Oh, you know? no. Um, obviously, I dance a lot more than any other Zach previously, um, I guess because I can. Uh, although my body doesn't necessarily feel that right now. Um, I broke a toe within two days of coming on the stage. Uh, I've uh, torn my hamstring. I've uh, ripped my calf. <laughs> I've done, you name it, I've done it over the, the last... Name of show business. I'm a walking human chibi grip right now. Um, I think some of the ages of characters may have changed. Um, uh, Mark, he's previously played by a character that I think that is over 20, whereas here he's states that he's 18 years old that was a one change and I think there have been subtle changes choreographically um, and age changes mainly Uh, the show is pretty much a uh, recreation or you know exact recreation of the original production of the original production Michael Bennett's and of course and of Bob's um, uh, because Bob actually is, Bob Avian, the, the, yeah, the Bob, uh, yeah, he actually is uh, the one number that you see at the end of the show. That's actually Bob's work. Bob actually choreographed that specific number, not Michael. So yeah, a little bit, a little tidbit for you there. Trivia. Yeah, a little bit of trivia, a little bit and, of chorus line trivia. And, yeah. and, and what a show it is! I mean, it's so iconic this show. And I, I was at opening night, and it, what a buzz! You know, I mean, the people are so excited to have this show. I Back. think it's the sort of show that resonates not just with actors or performers or people in the West End. This is a show about anybody that's got an aspiration to achieve or anybody that's worked so hard to achieve something. Not necessarily, you know, acting or singing or, you know, what any of that, any sort of aspiration. That's why it resonates with people. You know, it is the forefather, the godfather to these sort of reality-based talent shows that we cannot get enough of. You know, everyone's an armchair critic. We all love to sit at home and look at that person and go, mm, she can't really sing. Or, oh, he's a bit fat. Or, God, why did he pick him? You know, that's what we do. We love it. I mean, I, I, I almost sat in the theatre to think we should have a button as to whether <laughs> she gets the part or doesn't get the part. Right, sure. I don't know whether I'd go that far. You'd never get out of the theatre alive, would you, I think, half the time. But... For me, it's just been a, it's been a really humbling experience to be a part of this show. We feel, as a London company, that we're caretakers of this show, really. You're passing um, the beacon down, aren't you? Yeah, we, 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 you feel a responsibility each night to make the show uh, as authentic and as truthful and as genuine uh, as you can, to strip away, to not add anything on top, to not play the show for laughs. There are a lot of lines in the show that could, you know, that border on cultish. A lot of Sheila's lines border on cultish. There are a lot of lines that those audiences, you know, audiences are waiting for. And it's our job to kind of play against all of that, to play against the applause, uh, for me especially, you know, there is no audience, you know. So when numbers finish and the applause, you know, I have to gauge all of that sort of thing. But we really try and, and fight against all of that and to try and keep it as truthful as possible. But I have to tell you, 
it is so hard to sit in the auditorium and play a scene with somebody 100 foot away, especially when the woman next to you is opening her Marks and Spencer's bag and taking out her Chinese style chicken wings and eating them in the theatre. Now to anybody that is listening to this podcast, if you are one of those people that okay. comes to the theatre with food in your bag or goodness knows what else in your bag, <laughs> please, can I ask you, can I beg you, can I implore you not to do it? Because, it, I mean, audiences, I tell you, the lights go down. I don't know what possesses some people when the lights go off. They feel I paid my £65 to be here. I'm going to do whatever I jolly, I own this seat and I'm going to... But, it, it, but it, surely if you've paid your £65, you want to hear it. You want to be there to be a part of it. Go to the toilet, folks, please. Don't spend £65 and then spend 20 minutes in the toilet through the show because you are going to miss something that you're really going to regret later. I mean, it, that amazes me. It, it, it brings me on to my next question. How do you... This might sound silly, but and you'll correct me, but how do you just act with your voice? It's like a radio play for me in, in, in a lot of respects. And um, I think I've learned a lot through TV over the last five years about colouring your voice without volume in, in, in a way. Because when you're on TV, you know, people speak really, really quietly. And especially on something like EastEnders, that is amplified even more. I mean, people are kind of you're like, sorry, what did you say? Like people are inaudible. But... But I have learned a lot about how to colour in that way. And so I try to, you know, I, I, once again, I try to be truthful and I try to be real and I try to keep everything stripped back. Um, but I'm on a handheld mic and in some ways you're very much in control. It's uh, it's like when you're singing in, in a My club. Would be in a it, 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 yes, but as far as sort of colouring and as far as acting purely with your voice, there are many sort of techniques you can use with a handheld microphone in that way to uh, to help with that, to add warmth or distance or or power. So I tend to use that quite a lot. So uh, do you come to this piece as a seasoned musical theatre performer? Because you mentioned the dancing, you have more dancing because you can do it. What's your background in musical theatre? I've done um, a lot of musical theatre. I went into Cats when I was 16. Um, and then I've done all those sorts of big shows. Cats and Starlight, Miss Saigon, Grease, uh, The Fix, okay. Tommy, Notre Dame, Jazzy Chaperone, Rent. Um, the list kind of goes on. And, and how do you find this piece differs to all the other ones? You know... I, of, I often used to say, you know, all musicals are the same. You just wear different costumes and sing different songs, but they're all the same. Um, and I think in some ways that was my own naivety in a way uh, because I was speaking more about my life as opposed to the piece in a sense. Um, this show for me uh, feels like I've come home in the sense that I'm able to use all of the experiences I've had from being a 16 year old chorus boy in Cats to now in some ways stepping over the other side of the line um, the fact that I've sort of got a, a small profile and a, a, an element of celebrity in my life now means different opportunities are presented to me and so I know what it feels like to be 17 and to be straight out of school and to walk into an audition to look around the room and think yeah I've got this I can actually yeah, I can really do this. And I also know what it's like to be 33 and 34 and to still be in that same audition room and to be looking at that 17-year-old kid thinking, oh, my God, really, can I keep doing this? Can I continue to do this? And so I'm able to bring, I'm able to understand all of those viewpoints of all of those people on on the line, on my line. And, and that's what's great about the piece is not only literally do the audience see themselves on the stage because of the mirror, but they, a lot of the people who come to the show, they're all, you know, young actors and young actresses. They all know what it feels like to walk into an, to an audition room. Mm. And all the actors on stage know what it's like to have walked into an audition room. The mm. show very famously had an open casting and they had a thousand people turn up and stand in the rain outside the London Palladium for... Mm seven hours what was your audition process like for you was it different or yeah it's very different because uh, that's what I was trying to say in the sense that I didn't audition in that way things are 
presented to me now or, or I'm asked if I would like to uh, yeah, consider yeah. being, well I wouldn't say that I can you know I wouldn't say that I can completely choose my projects I can say well you know okay I fancy doing this L make it happen it's not like that but I was approached about the role and Bob Avian and myself went out to dinner and we talked about what he wanted. I talked about what I wanted. It was a very grown up, honest conversation. Uh, I wasn't necessarily too enamored at playing this role. It wasn't necessarily something that I thought I wanted to do. Um, for lots of reasons, A, I wasn't necessarily sure that a musical was right for me at uh, this time. B, I also wasn't sure that physically I would be able to uh, do it justice. Um, uh, I was uh, at one time in my career a very, very good dancer and part of me wanted to be remembered like that. I wasn't sure that I'd be able to get physically fit enough to be able to do the choreography to a standard that I myself would have considered good enough, let alone putting it in front of an audience. Um, and I had no concept of the show really other than the movie, which is a word that you do not mention to oh. purists of a uh, chorus line. So um, it, it was quite, quite an odd, uh, it was quite an odd meeting uh, and one that was left uh, very much up in the air. We then had, I was then sent a script. Uh, I read through the script and suddenly went, oh, there's a lot more to this than I'd uh, considered. Um, then I had another meeting with Bob at his hotel and then we went, okay, let's do it. You made the right decision. Uh, and it's a wonderful show and congratulations. I really appreciate that. It's been, you know, it, every night, it's still a real learning curve for me because I only came in on two weeks rehearsal. I only had two weeks rehearsal before the first preview, everybody, because I was doing something else. Uh, and so I'm only now, today is my five and a half weeks with the show. So uh, in my mind, by next week, that's when I figure my, <laughs> I'd be ready to open, you know. So I'm still... You're still playing around with the character. I'm not necessarily playing around with the character because that those, in some ways, they, they've been the easiest bits to kind of lock down because I've worked with Bob... Uh, a lot on that uh, and there isn't really with this show that much leeway for interpretation it's very much on the page uh, and, and it's very obvious uh, as to where it should go um, I totally I actually mean about having the choreography in my body having stamina um, listening to the music and going oh yeah I hear that now because everything happens, you know, for the, since we've opened, really, everything's been happening at breakneck speed and it's all been kind of a blur. But I'm able to kind of sit in it now and kind of go, ah, OK, now I hear that little bit there. Now I'm, So I'm starting to piece that side of it together more. Um, and it, it's such a shame Marvin Hamlish is not around to see this production. I mean, his legend lives on at the Palladium. But listen, Terry, his wife, spoke to us all before... Uh, our opening night and she spoke so movingly she told us that Marvin knew this production was coming here before he passed away this was information that was not known to anybody uh, to our producers or to us uh, uh, but Marvin uh, did know that this show was coming here before he passed away because it was something that he really really wanted to happen and Terry spoke so movingly about him uh, we really feel like he's here you know we really feel yes. that his spirit is here uh, uh, but it's so easy to say isn't it oh yeah he is but we actually feel it we actually really do feel it uh, and it was so wonderful to have Terry here on our opening night and uh, Michael's brother uh, who who sent me a lovely card and was like, we're family now, you're, you're, you're my brother now. And I was like, it, it meant so much to me. It was a hugely, it was probably the most emotional opening I've ever experienced of a show and probably will again. Right. I, mean, I mean, we were, it, it really was overwhelming As in a way. Member, I was certainly close to tears. It was overwhelming for, for many, many reasons. And um, I'll never forget it. It really will be with me so it really will be with me for life so the show continues at the london palladium so thank you very much john for talking to us Listen, and good, good luck tonight thank you so much and enjoy the book of mormon <laughs> musical talk so i want to talk to my friend robert gordon about chorus line which we've both seen it's it's uh, been revived in the west end 
Is revived the right word, Robert? Uh, no, I think in a way this is a museum production because it's been redone by some of the people who were the, 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 the co-choreographer, Bob Avian, and Bayok Lee, who sort of seems to revive... Well, she played Connie in the original Broadway production. Yes, and she's been actually reviving the musical on tours ever since. I think this has been her virtually her entire career. Living off the profits. Absolutely. Um, uh, and, of course, Chorus Line ran for 15 years on Broadway, so it sort of never stopped uh, until... A decade ago, and it's been done, you know, toured around the states, toured around the world. So this is a sort of an extension, I think, of the touring that's been done for ages. Although it must be said, uh, it's been completely recast in in Britain uh, with some very good performers. And I think what I liked about the production was the quality of the performances. Mm. Not everybody has liked the performances, but I think they're very good. And I think. Uh, there are one or two people. I'm not quite sure why everybody raves about um, the the singing of uh, what I did for love. Uh, I, I, By Victoria Hamilton Barrett. The, Victoria Hamilton Barrett. The night I saw it, it, it seemed to me that she it, the song wasn't properly in her range. But that was the first night you went. Uh, I went to the first night of previews in mm. London. Yes, yes. So I don't know. You saw it on the opening night. I don't know if the if it felt more comfortable for her the song. But it, well, I mean, I I. I literally want to whip my hair out every time I hear that song, but until I saw it on stage and you have 30 people singing it, it's actually quite moving. Yes, it is moving, but in a sense it's superfluous to the to the action of the piece, which is my problem. My problem wasn't with the production, which I thought was very good, very, mm. very well performed, um, but the problem, I think, has always been, and I remember this the first time round, I saw it when it came to Britain uh, in the late 70s, and... Um, I I felt that then that it's brilliant music by Marvin Hamlish, um, it's a really weird book which is craftsmanlike but in my view awful and I'll, I'll tell you why. Well, it, it, and the lyrics are okay but uh, nothing nothing special. To me, it just seemed like a song cycle with monologues. In a way, you're right. That's exactly what they did, and I I, ha I have nothing against that because I think what they were doing in deconstructing the traditional Broadway book musical was interesting. But what I find is that the actual psychology of the characters, the actual the way in which the drama is developed, is um, uh, you know dramaturgy uh, one hundred and one. I mean, it's very very simplistic. Uh, it's very American. In the bad sense, I mean, I think there's a, there's a good sense when you when you, when you Everyone say one has a therapist. And all that kind well, of stuff. exactly. When you say something's American, you know, there are good sides to that. But the and the good side to that is the slickness and the pizzazz of 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 the, the staging of the show. And the bad side is simply that the book purports to be serious and an in depth look at these people, but it's really simplified and it's very easy. I think. Uh, you, you know, it, it, for, for example, we don't know what happens to the little homosexual uh, dancer who who gets carried off with a, with an injury. Is he seriously injured? Can he ever dance again? Uh, I mean, if they're really trying to show the stresses and strains of being a Broadway show dancer, they might well have used that character to show that he had an injury and was never able to dance again. But they don't go there. They they never go anywhere. Uh, 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 dangerous, I think, because in the end, the story, although it wants to show us how difficult it is just to be a chorus dancer on Broadway, ultimately wants to celebrate chorus dancers. And Michael Bennett and the writers never make up their mind whether they're critiquing Broadway for its ruthlessness or whether they are celebrating it for its charm and, and, and vitality. Maybe it does both, because what I li liked about the production was how um, they all came on to, to, and, and they all did their one singular sensational chorus line and uh, you didn't know who was who and I think we've grown to love or maybe hate you know some of these people over the last two hours and then when we get to see them actually doing the show that they're auditioning for they, again they just turn in they just turn into a generic chorus line and I thought that was quite effective and, and I, I, I did enjoy it, but that's because I've only ever seen the film, of which we'll never mention again. And it was really nice seeing it in the theatre, and it was a lot funnier than I thought it would have been as well, partly due to Lee Zimmerman, who plays the, dare I say, old at 30, um, you know, um, 
kind of motherly figure she had you know some of the best lines in the show what do you want to be when you grow up young and you know all that kind of stuff so i i i certainly enjoyed it very much yes it's fun but it's broadway shtick it's not real wit uh, it's it's broadway shtick and i think that of course the the broadway insiders who produced and wrote the show are very tongue-in-cheek very very knowing um, but in a way, that's what I don't like about the show. I think it purports to be serious, as a lot of stuff on Broadway does, but ends up actually only being shallow. So, yes, a great entertainment, but certainly not, I think, the revolutionary piece of theatre that it was claimed to be. Uh, I think that what we now see at a distance in time is that two shows opened on Broadway within months of each other. One was A Chorus Line, which ran for 15 years, and the other was uh, Chicago, which initially ran for about two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Now but it's, for 800 years. And it's now, it seems to me that it's Chicago, which is the great and serious show, but people don't realise it because it's entirely comic. But I think, for example, if Bob Fosse had staged Chorus Line, the uh, boy uh, who gets injured would probably have died at the end and we would have gone on singing the Chorus Line. And that actually would be truer to the ruthlessness of the production factory, mm. which is Broadway. You do it regardless of your injury or not. Well... The show goes on even if somebody's dying and people are saying one singular sensation when actually one person has just died. So so the harshness of the ending was not allowed to carry forward in the show. I mean, in the end, what is the audience applauding? And all the bloggers seem to have said this. All, the audience is actually applauding the, 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 the skill and the, and the talent uh, that has gone into making that chorus line at the end look stunning. What I do worry about this show is I was there on opening night, you were there on the first time to preview, so, and it was very, very, you know, blatant that there are theatre people watching this performance. The Play Gym is a vast house, it's bigger than any Broadway theatre, and seats, you know, 2,500 people or something like that. Do you see it selling out for a year, filling 2,500 people eight times a week, Robert? No, I don't. I think they're already... uh, um... Uh, if you Google uh, the theatre, you can already see there are seats at all prices, which is not a good sign for a show that's open to so much hype. Uh, It seems to me that this is not a show that British people love as much as Broadway audiences. It's, it's It's mythically about Broadway. It's not about anything to do with British life or society or culture. And I think, yes, of course, you're right. Uh, it appeals massively to insiders. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a People show... People were laughing at stuff I didn't get. And... It's a show about show business. The night I saw it, which was the first preview, there must have been lots of actors and performers and theatre people in complimentary seats. And actually, they were applauding the overture. Yeah. I mean, the, the minute... The, the, it's wonderfully staged, this show. I mean, we cannot... I mean, we'll talk about that in a bit. But, the, but when it, the lights come up, you have... Well, what I loved immediately was when the lights went down... And you were in pitch black for about 10 seconds, which very rarely all the exit signs went off and you were literally being moved to another space and and another time. And then, and they're all facing the mirror, you hear kind of a tinny piano, and then the orchestra kicks in and then the audience went nuts. And I thought, that was great. But are they applauding the fact that they finally get to see Chorus Line on stage? because this is the first time it's ever had a big London production in many people's lifetime. Mine, for example, not yours. Um, or are they applauding the fact that this is a really clever show and they're, you know, they're aware of the intricacies of the piece? I do want to um, mention the fact that it must be very difficult to stage and learn bad choreography, because there are some dancers who don't get the moves and, and they're all in, out of line with each other. So, I mean, that was st- stuck in my mind for the for the piece. And also, what the heck was going through the actors' heads when they were auditioning for this piece about auditioning for a show to play? You know, it's all kind of... Um, self-reflexive. Yeah, self-reflecting and like a sort of a, a parallel continuum in a way. Yes, I think I think in a sense that's the charm of the show for show business people, for theatre people, is that it's all about them and it's constantly reflecting about them. Um, It's narcissistic in the way that a lot of popular American culture and British culture, but particularly American culture, is today. It's it's totally about itself. And that's what I object to. I've no, I've no, you know, I enjoy the insider jokes, for example, what you get in Kandra and Ebb's curtains. Uh, but then there is a story there that appeals to outsiders because there's a detective story. Here, there is no story apart from really the backstories of each character, which is, as you say, 
uh, are told in a series of monologues or soliloquies in song. Um, and I think that those stories are of no interest to the general public. I don't see uh, British people getting on coaches and coming from up north the way they have for Billy Elliot to see this show. I, and I don't see why they should. Would you, I mean, but are, wouldn't you say arguably that the recession will, I mean, that struck true during this piece and people looking for work and people who cannot get work, that comes across in the, in the piece. That's for everyone, I think. The poverty of the dancers and the, 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 the small salaries comparatively that they earn even on Broadway isn't mentioned at all in the show. Uh, I mean, no no one seems to be in need financially in this show. They are in need. Uh, I mean, the, the nearest we get is Cassie saying, I need a job. But she doesn't say that. I, I, well, I, suppose, I think she more or less implies otherwise she'll be working uh, at Macy's or something as a store assistant. But but um, nobody else says that. And I don't think that's examined. I think that's if you were doing this show as a as a as a British chorus line set in London, that's the reality of most actors and uh, dancers' lives, is that basically most of their lives they're out of work. I think you and I should do the English version, ensemble. I think you, you're quite right. It strikes me, having said that, that that's quite a good idea, because I, I do think an English audience would take a darker uh, look at, at this. But you see, there is such a mythology of, 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 um, about musical theatre on Broadway that it's part of the American dream becoming a star or even a great chorus dancer on Broadway. I mean, w w the concept of the piece is you are in the theatre watching this audition process. But yet this, and I don't know if the original had this, this production felt the need to say on the proscenium arch before the show began, time, 1975, place a Broadway theatre, thus completely removing us from the fact that we are about to witness a rehearsal. A piece of reality. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I think that you're right. I think that uh, that was probably, they were probably advised to do that for the London for the London run, um, so that it made some sort of historical sense, also so that it historicised the piece. But I think that's the it, problem. It, it certainly becomes a period piece nowadays. Yes, but they don't actually historicise it properly. I mean, what, what shocked me, in a way, was they've chosen to use exactly the same costumes, which, after all, are only practice costumes. Uh, uh, but they're still designed for this production. You know, they're still, they're still made for the actors. Yes, but they're actually based on designs that were made in 1975. Uh, and I think, well... It may have been good in 1975, but it wasn't that good that you'd want to actually keep the same designs. Perhaps it's a matter of economics. So, so do you think it would have worked if it said, place a Broadway theatre time 2013? I think it would have worked better if it hadn't. they hadn't said anything. And actually, if they'd slightly updated the fashions so that it could have been today... I don't really see why that would have been any kind of problem. Possibly the book would have looked more old-fashioned than it actually did, even. But I think Blimey. that. But I felt the book was old-fashioned in 1970. Whenever I saw it, 1979. But ultimately, you cannot fault the people at work in this production. I think that's what makes it a true joy for anyone to see. Certainly, if you have not seen a chorus line, I cannot urge you to go and see it. I'm going to see it again because I I, I I did really love it, and I just feel it will not. A, it won't be around long. And B, it will never come around again to this standard. On the plus side, I have to say, if you've never seen a chorus line on stage, the advantage of this is it gives you a glimpse of what the original production was. And maybe was. that's what they're trying to do. Was. Yeah, well, they're trying to they're, make money. They're not uh, feeling the need to do anything new, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, they think that there's still money in it, uh, so they may as well, you know, and they none of them really have the talent of, of Michael Bennett, no one involved in this has the talent of Michael Bennett to remake it, to, 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 to improve it for today. But what I would say, I mean, you know, having, having rubbished the, 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 the dramaturgy of the show and, and its point of view, it's brilliantly staged by Michael Bennett. It was brilliantly staged in the beginning. We get the exact same lighting plot, which... Wonderful lighting. Which is wonderful. It struck me when I saw it in the late 70s. Uh, even then, I had never seen a show where the dancers were lit as in dance, as in contemporary dance pieces, which w w were revolutionary in those days, where you, you, you have lighting from all angles, lighting of all colours. You have individual people being picked up by spotlights within the chorus. You have whole sculptures being created by stage groups and lighting and that was was remarkable uh, throughout the show and it's still there and it still looks good even though of course everybody's cribbed it so, for, since then um and although i don't think michael bennett is a great choreographer in the sense that uh, um 
Bob Fosse uh, uh, and um, uh, Jerome Robbins were. Uh, he doesn't Gillian make Lynn even, you know, sort of. Well, no, I wouldn't call Gillian Lynn a great choreographer in that sense. I'm talking about people who've advanced American dance, um, people who who would be recognised uh, within the dance world as real choreographers. Those are people who know how to make steps, who really know how to make steps. These are all the traditional Broadway steps, but brilliantly put together by Michael Bennett, Bennett and staged with absolute cunning. I use the word cunning because there are a lot of theatrical tricks in the show which look incredibly simple. Uh, I mean, the positioning of the dancers' hats, the the, 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 the way in which, the, the, the angle at which the dancers move towards the audience. It's not always straight lines, although it seems like that. Um, the moments at which the kick line is timed, which always gets applause, which is strange, but it's all staged and crafted in such a way that all of that happens. And above all, I think Martin Hamlish's wonderful music, Hamlish. Martin Hamlish's wonderful Martin. music, Marvin Hamlish has wonderful music, which um, which is you know um, it seems to me he he manages to capture in a strange and deconstructed way through the uh, orchestrations and the and the and the melodies and the harmonies um, he manages to capture the old Warner Brothers Busby Berkeley musicals of the 30s which is the tradition from which this kind of show derived you know the backstage show let's put on a show uh, sort of idea and he manages to capture that but in a ghost-like way in a way that you realize is counterpointed against the sort of 70s feel of the instrumentation and certainly the show is a tribute to Marvin Hamlish I think I think the, the, if, if I were, uh, am not being churlish, I would say the best thing about this is that it's a wonderful tribute today and a necessary tribute to a great theatre composer. This episode of Musical Talk was presented by Nick Hudson and Robert Gordon and edited by Nick Hudson. For more information, visit www.acoruslinelondon.com or follow Musical Talk on Twitter at twitter.com slash musicaltalk, Facebook at facebook.com slash musicaltalk, or listen to all our previous episodes on iTunes or at musicaltalk.co.uk. This is a Musical Talk production, copyright.